Welcome to the New York City Bar Association podcast. Opinions expressed are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the city bar. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another podcast hosted by the City Bar Task Force on Digital Technologies. My name is Jerome Walker, and I will moderate this podcast. By way of background, I am co-chair of the task force. When it comes to U.S. national security issues, and especially the financial stability of the uh, U.S. financial system, there are numerous governmental authorities at the federal, state, and local level. For instance, at the federal level, some of the familiar names at the cabinet level include the Department of Justice, Department of Treasury, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Commerce, Department of State, the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Other major players within those departments or independent agencies include U.S. attorneys across the U.S., the FBI, the CIA, DEA, FinCEN, OFAC, the SEC, the CFTC, the OCC, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, and the CFPB. That's a lot of agencies for market participants and stakeholders to consider in the digital technology space. And that's why it's such a challenge to be in the U.S. trying both to protect the financial system and the national security of the U.S. and trying to protect our clients that we serve and do right in terms of the public mandate to protect the system. These agencies administer and enforce numerous laws and regulations and regularly issue guidance and other issuances that market participants must consider. Familiar names at the state level and local level include state banking and insurance departments, such as the New York State Department of Financial Services and the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation and state attorneys general and local prosecutors, such as the Brooklyn DA and the Special Narcotics Prosecutor of the City of New York. These agencies administer and enforce numerous laws and regulations and regularly issue guidance and other issuance that market participants, policymakers, and others consider all the time and update uh, regularly. In the digital technologies area, many laws and regulations lag behind uh, these and other technologies and law enforcement and regulatory authorities, as well as market participants and other stakeholders are still trying to navigate unchattered territory in some instances. Today's podcast is the start of a discussion regarding effective approaches for market participants and other stakeholders to understand the actions and activities of law enforcement and regulatory agencies in the digital technologies uh, arena. I'm very pleased to introduce four members of the task force who will serve as guests today and will help make sense of many of the key actions of law enforcement and regulatory agencies and how market participants can effectively work with government authorities to protect national security and the financial system. In alphabetical order, by last name, our guests include Clark Abrams. Clark is a member of the Task Force Subcommittee on Law Enforcement and Regulatory Agency Digital Technologies Activities and a member of the City Bar Compliance Committee. He's also Chief Money Laundering and Financial Investigations Unit Special Narcotics Prosecutor for the City of New York. Kyle Armstrong is a co-chair of the Task Force Subcommittee on Law Enforcement and Regulatory Agency Digital Technologies Activities. He's also the Director of Law Enforcement Relations at TRM and a former FBI Unit Chief of the FBI's Counterterrorism Finance Targeting Unit. Jesse Brooks is a co-chair of the Task Force Subcommittee on Law Enforcement and Regulatory Agency Digital Technologies Activities. She's also Chief Compliance Officer of Ribbit Capital and a former Senior Assistant U.S. Attorney in the National Security Section at the U.S. Attorney's Office. Alola Katz is a member of the Task Force Subcommittee on Law Enforcement and Regulatory Agency Digital Technologies Activities and the Task Force Subcommittee on Cybersecurity, Privacy, and Data Protection. She's also Chief of the Virtual Currency Unit of the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. 
since there are so many law enforcement and regulatory agencies, we will need to level set the discussion so that the audience can follow the discussion. Jesse, let's start with you. Would you please explain what some of the U.S. national security issues are and why market participants and stakeholders in the digital technologies area should care about national security's issue? In that context, would you also explain why market participants and other stakeholders should help prevent illicit activities by terrorist groups like Hamas? North Korea and Iran, for example, are thousands of miles away. Why should the U.S. care what those countries do outside of the U.S.? Russia is another example of an aggressive country that invaded another country, in this case, Ukraine. From a U.S. policy standpoint, why should that matter? What role does DOJ play in the national security arena? Thanks, Jerome. And thanks for having me, especially amongst all these hard hitters here. Those are a lot of good questions, and I think each of them could be spoken about for many hours. But I just want to level set with the concept that national security should matter to everyone and does matter to everyone, particularly when we think about new technologies. There, you can think about the conversation around TikTok and social media or AI. And this is especially the case in technologies and financial services like crypto. And why is that? I guess I think about it in three sort of buckets. So first, one of the reasons why it's so important in national security is, and the reason why I work in the crypto space is, a lot of us are trying to build a new financial system that gives financial access to people that didn't have it before, that makes the rails um, easier for people all over the world to engage. And the concept of this is really global. Crypto is supposed to be global, although the goal is to regulate it at country level. But because it's global and because it's going to require a full overhaul of the financial infrastructure system, we need to think about how that's going to affect geopolitics. We need to think about how the U.S. can continue to control its currency as well as other countries can continue to control its currency as money moves faster across borders and as different countries try and leverage this new technology in different ways. And we're seeing that in, in many different ways. So as we build this technology and think about it, I think the builders in the space, which are the people I work with now on this side, really need to be thinking about national security as they build because it's essential. Another part of that is that we're seeing illicit finance in this space, just like with all technologies. But I don't want to overlook the fact that there is illicit finance in this space, whether it be by Hamas, which is the conversation that you brought up a moment ago in a case that Kyle and I worked out together, or the many hacks by DPRK. And the reason why those are so important for everybody is one, those are really violent extremist groups that you can't expect just because you're on the other side of the country that you're going to escape from their effect, but also the amount of money stolen by an entity like DPRK through crypto and through other means is building up their ability to be more of a physical threat to both North Korea and other countries that are allies of the United States. So the way that they get access to money, whether through crypto or otherwise, is something that everyone in the space should be thinking about. And so as we build, we need to make sure that we're protecting the assets from bad actors because you can't just say, oh, DPRK is far away and we don't really need to think about it. Instead, all technology, particularly crypto, which is supposed to be fast, which is supposed to be global, which is supposed to be cross-border, really needs to focus on these issues. And it's increasingly becoming um, one that people are building in, which is within the cybersecurity preventing hack space, which I can talk more about later. And then the third aspect is really just the U.S. competition side of it, which is a really important concept when we think about building the crypto space. So right now, the U.S. is obviously a really strong financial power in the world that has been for a long time, but we cannot take that for granted. And what we're seeing in the crypto space is a lot of people avoiding the U.S. markets and also choosing to build elsewhere. And that's for a number of reasons. One of them is that there's a lot of sentiment in the United States, rightfully or wrongfully, but it is what is happening that is anti-crypto and anti-blockchain development right now, or just uncertain about how the regulations might apply to certain tokens. And because of that, as an investor, I'm seeing a lot of companies that are saying, you know what, 
It's not worth it at this point. Let's build elsewhere. And other countries are not taking that view. You can look at what's happening in China with their CBDC, what they're forcing out into both Chinese and African economies through different cell phone projects. And if we're not careful in the United States and we continue to push this technology out, China is going to get a real benefit from that and a real boost in its economy. So this is a wide ranging conversation, a wide ranging topic. But I guess it just comes down to the U.S. needs to focus on innovation. However, the innovators really need to focus on the safety of the technology, especially as it spreads. And both sides need to come together and collaborate on the importance of this space. Thanks, Jesse. Clark, Jesse covered a lot of national security grounds, especially in the fight to prevent terrorism and stop the financing of terrorism. Her main focus was at the federal level and to a certain extent internationally as well. Would you please explain how the U.S. at the federal, state, and local levels fight narcotics trafficking and money laundering? For example, I recently read a DEA press release where the DEA sees over 100 pounds of cocaine, crack cocaine, fentanyl, oxycodone, and heroin in a brunt uh, pizzeria. That uh, press release, by the way, was October 23rd, uh, 2023. Similarly, I recently read a press release from your office, which indicated that the special narcotics prosecutor uncovered a large stash of over 110 pounds of fentanyl and other drugs worth up to 10 million in the Bronx. And that press release was November 16th, 2023. Clearly, the fight against illicit activity is very challenging. Who are some of the key players involved from law enforcement? And what should market participants and stakeholders in digital technologies do to help with the fight? During your explanation, would you please also briefly explain the Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2020 and how it should help with the fight against illicit activity? Jerome, your timing with respect to this podcast is impeccable. Yesterday, February 14th, Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco announced that the U.S. Department of Justice will seek harsher penalties for crimes committed with the aid of artificial intelligence. She said, quote unquote, every new technology is a double-edged sword, but AI may be the sharpest blade yet. Analogize artificial intelligence to a firearm. Both can magnify the danger of a crime. Thank you for inviting me. Any opinion I express is done so in my personal capacity. As the head of my agency, New York City Special Narcotics Bridget Brennan has stated, the number of fentanyl deaths is so large that it has had the effect of lowering life expectancy in the United States. It has become, I suggest, a national security issue. Although the death, although the death statistics nationally seem to be leveling, New York State overdoses have continued to rise. Our chemists wear protective gloves and a mask when testing suspected cocaine. Our chemist Don has mat suits when testing suspected fentanyl. New York City is a regional drug hub. hub. Drugs are consumed in New York City and distributed throughout New York State and the Northeast Coast. How do we fight drug traffic along cocaine and heroin as well as fentanyl? One, supply reduction. International cooperation with respect to the origin of the drug and precursors. Interdiction. I can't speak to the details because I don't understand them thoroughly yet, but this involves and will involve the use of artificial intelligence. Prosecutions drug to, of drug trafficking organizations, both foreign and domestic, as well as the transporters, the couriers, and those involved in street sales. And that includes initiatives designed to take back the streets that are ruined by street-level drug sales. Two, demand reduction. That involves education, programs for users, and gang initiative. And where the gang initiative applies to supply reduction as well. Three, money laundering. Take away the profit from the drug dealers. That involves criminal prosecutions as well as forfeiture confiscation of assets, which is usually done civilly. We target the money laundering organizations, the money or the peso brokers, 
And now that includes money laundering via crypto. Our investigative techniques include good old fashioned physical surveillance, analysis of phone and financial records, court authorized electronic surveillance, such as a tracking device on a phone or vehicle, search warrants of physical locations, phones, and email accounts, court authorized eavesdropping, and the use of confidential sources, otherwise known as informants. We've initiated financial investigations based on a suspicious activity report, a SAR. But usually, our financial investigations begin with the use of confidential sources, who themselves are money, peso brokers. That is, they launder for the drug trafficking organizations. With respect to crypto, we trace the flow of value on the blockchain and utilize subpoenas, analyze the results that we get, search warrants and email accounts and phones and sources, confidential sources to try to identify the participants on the blockchain. Our objective is to work our way up the food chain, lower level money launderer to the higher level money launderer, to the highest level money launderer just direct to drug trafficking. The key players from domestic to international, local, county and state law enforcement, New York City Police Department, County law enforcement, such as the Nassau County Police Department and Sheriff's Department, the New York State Police. Federal agencies, and this is, this is really two-part, the agencies themselves, Customs Border and Protection, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the FBI occasionally, Homeland Security Investigations, Postal Inspectors, and the federal task forces. We work at Special Narcotics with the DEA-based Drug Enforcement Task Force and Strike Force, both of which focus for the most part on the drug side, and the HSI-based El Dorado Task Force, which focuses on money laundering, and then we work back to identify the underlying criminal conduct that generated the proceeds. Rely on our inter international partners, usually in conjunction with DEA and HSI agents assigned to foreign embassies, with our international partners' assistance, we obtain evidence, and sometimes it's on an informal basis, sometimes it's formal through a mutual legal assistance treaty request or a memorandum of understanding. And we also rely on international assistance for extraditions. Recently, I had a occasion to prepare a mutual legal assistance treaty and for something that was somewhat unusual. It was during the coronavirus when the court was holding proceedings remotely. The defendant had been allowed to go back to his country and we were ready for sentencing. And he asked whether he could be sentenced remotely. The court was amenable, but we needed to make sure that his country would honor a remote sentencing and that required a mutual legal assistance treaty. Fortunately, the country agreed because the defendant was sentenced to a term of incarceration. And if his country had not agreed to honor our sentencing, then uh, we wouldn't have had the leverage to get him into the United States to serve his sentence. Role of market participants and stakeholders. Be a gatekeeper. That term has been used by U.S. Treasury and by the Financial Action Task Force, which is the leading non-governmental money laundering and terrorist finance organization in the world to apply to attorneys, even though attorneys are not considered gatekeepers yet under U.S. law. But an attorney should ask, what is the purpose of the attorney's expertise? Approximately three weeks ago, an attorney was sentenced to 10 years in prison, having been convicted back in late 2019 of conspiracy to commit bank fraud and to launder money in connection with his cryptocurrency client. The attorney was ordered to forfeit nearly $400 million. The evidence at trial established that the attorney was aware that one coin, his client, operated as a pyramid scheme and set up investment funds to conceal the source of money and the beneficial owners of that money. But that scheme required a skilled attorney who here acted as a co-conspirator instead of as a gatekeeper to devise a laundering method that would fool the compliance staff at financial institutions. Admittedly, this attorney's conduct was extreme. And though failure to do your, your due diligence may not result in a prosecution, it could lead to an adverse regulatory action or proceeding. If you're a financial institution, then look for anomalies. 
If your customer tells you it is an import export company, then drill down to determine if the company is one of those or both and make sure the flow of funds in the company's bank account is consistent with whether it's importing or exporting. If the monthly or annual turnover in the account changes, then make sure you understand why. Make sure your compliance program is dynamic. When I, of all people, chatted with Playground OpenAI API, I was informed that criminals can use AI algorithms to disguise their activity in a way that evades detection by financial institutions who themselves have used AI algorithms to develop and enhance tra transaction monitoring. If that information is accurate and not a case of an AI model's hallucinating, a term used by SEC Chairman Gary Gensler this week, then you need to stay on top of the crooks. If you are a tax attorney or accountant with a client who trades in crypto, is your client filing accurate tax returns? Last week, an individual was indicted by a federal grand jury for failing to report gains on the sale of several million dollars worth of cryptocurrency. A brief word or two about the Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2020 and the Corporate Transparency Act of 2021. The, big, the biggest piece is the beneficial ownership requirement or what should be the biggest piece. These acts deal with set out um, a requirement for the government to identify AML and CTF counterterrorist financing priorities, enhance whistleblower protections. Uh, they suggest require a financial crime tech symposium. A note that our New York State Department of Financial Services held one fairly recently. And the acts expand who is covered under anti-money laundering laws. Dealers in, in antiquities, for example. The government's required to study dealers in art as to whether they should be added. Um, my opinion, currently, because the government does not verify beneficial ownership, that beneficial ownership will be of limited utility until such time that it is verified and relied upon by the government and the financial institutions with access to that information. Thanks, Clark. Lona, it's it pretty clear from the discussion with Jesse and Clark that there's a significant amount that's going on that stakeholders, compliance officers, AML, CFT compliance officers, and others have to deal with, and that in the digital technology space, there's a, a lot to learn. Your right. office is one of the governmental agencies that has identified illicit activity involving cryptocurrencies and dedicated an entire unit to that industry. Why did the Brooklyn DA create a special unit focused on cryptocurrencies? Have other governmental agencies at the federal, state, and local levels also focused their attention on this area as well? Does your office coordinate, for example, with other offices? What advice would you offer to the cryptocurrency industry regarding how to avoid or at least limit the risk of illicit activity in their products and services. Thanks, Jerome. Those are a bunch of really great questions. Before I dive in, I just have to give the disclaimer, as Clark did, all opinions are my own and not that of DA Eric Gonzalez or the office. There was something that the first thing that comes to mind is something that stood out to me when Clark was just talking that we have to stay on top of the people that we're investigating. And I think that was really the primary driving force in the Brooklyn DA's decision to launch and fund this new unit. I think historically, and in cryptocurrency world, historically is three years ago, <laughs> but for a long time, local and state law enforcement agencies and prosecutors' offices really deferred to the federal government to do cryptocurrency investigations. We didn't have necessarily the tools or the training. And we just thought that was a federal issue. And that has totally changed. I was recently at the um, California Crypto Conference in Santa Clara uh, County, and it was a gathering of mostly local and state cryptocurrency uh, law enforcement officers and prosecutors from across the country. And I attended the same conference last year. And in just the passage of a year, I can see how much has changed. Last year, we were just kind of wading in, getting our feet wet. The questions were 
at kind of still a very basic level. How do we work with an exchange? What's, what does this mean? And now there is just a level of expertise and education that you can see that everyone had gained throughout the past year. The questions were just at a higher level. A lot of agencies um, had seizures and cases or arrests or successful referrals um, under their belt. It wasn't just one or two agencies. So I think local law enforcement were very, were really on uh, the front lines. We're responding to 911 calls or responding to people walking into the per, into precincts. So we're very victim motivated and very responsive to the community. So there has been such an uptick and I can definitely speak for Brooklyn. And also I spent many years at the Manhattan DA's office as well of victims walking into the precinct, calling 911, reporting that they are victims of long-term cryptocurrency investment scams, being robbed for their cryptocurrency, or we're hearing from our you know, NYPD detectives in the field that a lot of uh, violent actors and gangs are using cryptocurrency to finance their activities. And I think it was really in response and an acknowledgement of that, that it became important to the Brooklyn DA's office to create this unit, the virtual currency unit. I think it's unique in that it's kind of standalone unit. I did not want it to be kind of siloed in complex financial frauds because my working theory is that crypto is everywhere and anywhere. It can pop up, you know, in any case. So I didn't want people, you know, in the in a trial bureau or special victims bureau to ever feel that crypto wasn't relevant to them or that they, you know, couldn't approach the unit for help. So it's like a, a free floating unit that can partner with any other unit within the Brooklyn DA's office and assist them in their investigations. And I think we I've seen that borne out in the types of cases that have been coming in. They have crossed over into violent gang investigations or we've been reaching out to the, the human trafficking unit as well. And I would say the primary uh, a number of cases that are coming in are from uh, victims of cryptocurrency um, investment fraud and that really underscores um, the need for why our local um, law enforcement officers need to be educated on how to triage these cases, about how to ask the right questions, because these victims of crypto investment fraud are walking into the precinct. They're probably more likely to know where their local precinct is than they are to know where the New York FBI field office. So they're going to the closest, most accessible law enforcement agencies to report these crimes. So I'm super passionate about local and state law enforcement joining this fight so we can adequately respond to the victims in our communities. Uh, thanks, uh, Alona. Uh, Kyle, uh, having um, listened to Jesse Clark and Alona explain um, a wide range of national security issues that arise in many of the digital technologies areas, I, I immediately think about you because you're in the interesting position of having been with the FBI investigating and helping DOJ prosecute illicit activity. And now your firm offers solutions to help market participants and stakeholders, including law enforcement and the regulatory agencies. Would you please explain how law enforcement and regulatory agencies work together to protect national security and the financial system from illicit activities and how law enforcement and regulatory agencies work together with the industry and stakeholders to protect national security. Jerome, thank you very much for arranging this, for having me. It, it, it's, it's great to be on with these esteemed actual prosecutors, attorneys here. So I really appreciate the, the time and my co-panelist time. Uh, you brought yes. up a, a really good question and you bring up really good insights about the the confluence of law enforcement, regulators, folks in the private industry, both applying those regulations and folks like me who work to help regulators and law enforcement do their jobs well. And I think most of the goal is about protecting, protecting people via the financial system. And so the brilliant Jesse Brooks brought up earlier some of the, the concerns about foreign nation states and the almost the hegemony of the U.S. dollar, things like that. Clark and Alona both hit on some really important discussion about 
the input of the regulatory system in how customers and uh, evaluating due diligence of transactions. I think a lot of that has to do with essentially, you know, identifying um, and preventing these transactions beforehand. So for example, a concrete example, yesterday on February 14th, Clark mentioned the Ms. Monaco, her proclamation, the Treasury Department, the U.S. Treasury Department, Office of Foreign Asset Control, Af OFAC, uh, announced a new sanction. One of the sanctioned entities, in Informatics Services Corporation, it's a subsidiary of the Central Bank of Iran. The Central Bank of Iran was sanctioned some years ago under a terrorism designation. ISC, the entity that was sanctioned yesterday, is really has to do with the sort of the technology arm of the Central Bank of Iran. And among other things, it's very instrumental in the development of Iran's central bank digital currency. So Iran's CBDC. Again, the sanctions law in practice is meant to, to deter and to encourage behavior that does not violate some executive order from the U.S. president. The International Emergency Economic Powers Act, IEPA, is the sanctions law. That is in place as a regulatory framework to encourage good conduct. When sanctions law is violated, that's when it steps into violation of federal criminal law in addition to regulatory law. And so one of the ways on the prevention mechanism, one of the ways that regulators law enforcement and others are working together is to identify violators of the sanctions law. And then for federal law enforcement to really go out and attempt to, to enforce the sanctions act. So you violate sanctions, federal law enforcement will then go out and try to effectuate a disruption based on that. Now thinking even more nuanced, the federal bank secrecy act, BSA, the Bank Secrecy Act, which is prescribed by regulators, is, and I think FinCEN is the primary agency, FinCEN being a part of the Treasury Department, that requires financial institutions, money service businesses to have a compliance program, to have a due diligence program, to essentially try to prevent illicit financial transactions. Once those, if the Bank Secrecy Act is violated, if an entity is not doing it, its job in enforcing the Bank Secrecy Act, that's where we have problems and that's where illicit transactions tend to take place. And so you have not only the federal regulatory system, but there are state regulatory systems where Ms. Katz sits in New York. New York has a very comprehensive financial regulatory infrastructure to ensure that these on-ramps and off-ramps into the financial system are protecting not only the system, but the underlying customers. And the same, the same with Mr. Abrams, who is enforcing violations of narcotics related to narcotics, money laundering. Those things take financial professionals and they take financial entities to help facilitate these transactions. With the regulators trying to build out this infrastructure to prevent these transactions, we have you know, a very good mechanism for encouraging good behavior. It's when folks violate those, those regulatory infrastructure and those regulatory rules where you step into the, into the criminal behavior. And when I worked with Ms. Brooks at the Department of Justice, that was one area that we would focus on. She was in prosecuting in the national security section for a while. And when I worked in the terrorism finance unit, that's where we were seeing violations of not just terrorism finance and the material support to terrorism, some of the well-known federal criminal statutes, but it all started a lot of times with violations of the regulatory infrastructure. And at one point we had really diligent cryptocurrency, virtual asset service providers, exchanges, filing SARS and letting us know when there were violations of their compliance and their Bank Secrecy Act requirements. And so that was a, a real help to the case when you had joint partners on the entity level, on the regulatory level, and then at the law enforcement level who were able to work together again 
in a sort of a, a benign sense to protect the financial system. But as Ms. Brooks brought up, to ultimately terrorism, financing terrorism or financing a weapons of mass destruction program for some of these nation states who are at odds with the Western society, that has real impact. And $50 in Bitcoin, whether it's, whether it's Bitcoin or it's a Western Union transfer or it's some other method, that has real tangible results on the end. That's the purchase of, a, of ammunition, of a Kalashnikov, of something that could be used for violence. And so that's why to put a bow on this thought is that's a, a big part of why we have the regulatory system in the first place is to protect not only the financial system, but to protect the end user from whether it's violence or some of these horrible fraud schemes that I know Ms. Katz is doing a great job prosecuting or the movement of illicit funds from cartels, which I know Mr. Mr. Abrams has done a really good job identifying and prosecuting. Thanks, Kyle. Jesse, when you listen to the four of you, that's a lot of ground to cover. With your law enforcement background and in your capacity as a chief compliance officer of a registered investment advisor, when you were kind of thinking about the range of possible laws and regulations that you have to worry about and your interest in protecting your client, but also protecting the financial system, what are some of the most important compliance issues? for registered investment advisors in the crypto space. What advice would you offer compliance officers and other independent risk managers to help them protect their firms and the financial system? Yeah, really great question and definitely shifting gears a little bit because the criminal conversation that we've been largely having, having is just the tip of the spear and honestly not in most of the conversations that I'm having. What's really interesting about my role is that I'm the compliance officer for a registered investment advisor that is regulated and overseen by the SEC, which we take with honor and grace and we try and apply. But we're also investing in crypto companies or crypto adjacent companies that are trying to build products that are compliant, whether it be under the BSA, whether it be under New York licensing, whether it be under international law, whether it be under the SEC rules about the how we test and securities. So when I engage with companies that are not yet regulated, but trying to figure out a bill, there's a lot of questions that come with that. Sanction compliance is probably the most important at that level. Then illicit finance and how to do KYC is second. And then you go from there to like licensing. What do you need? How are you going to build your product to make sure you're compliant? But internally, as a entity that's regulated by the SEC, but involving itself in crypto, just like when you involve yourself in any technology or any asset that maybe has a little bit of lack of clarity because it's new, et cetera, you have to really think about all the issues, ones that exist in traditional finance and perhaps ones that don't or don't yet. So I wrote a few down because there are so many, but um, I'll touch on a few quickly that are unique to crypto or at least like uniquely thought about in the crypto sense. So the first and the thing that has been on a lot of people's minds is custody. So as a regulated SEC entity, you need to use a qualified custodian to hold cu uh, like customer funds or investor funds. So when our investors give us money and then we invest in some token or a project that needs to be held in a certain way. What's interesting is that qualified custodians for crypto are few and far between, and they don't offer custody to all types of tokens. So something that's interesting there is if one of our projects issues a token, we can't be involved in that until a qualified custodian is willing to hold that token. So that's interesting. And then also regulated entities can't get involved in a lot of DeFi projects, like with providing liquidity or in taking loans or in helping support a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization, because those funds would then be held in like a smart contract, which isn't actually custody under the interpretation of the current rules. So thinking about how you have to act while simultaneously being helpful to your companies in the space is really interesting when it comes to the custody rule. And the SEC um, has a new proposed rule that will help develop this. Another thing that's really interesting, and we don't involve ourselves in this, but a lot of other investment advisors in the space, so I hope it's useful to your listeners, is 
DAOs in general and voting in DAOs and getting involved in DeFi. So right now, if you're involved in a DAO, so it's like a DeFi entity that's run by a decentralized autonomous organization, which is just a decentralized group of people involved in the protocol, you frequently, depending on the protocol, are asked to vote on certain things. Should I audit this smart contract as a protocol in order to make it safer? Should I require people to pay more to get involved? Should we allow this wallet to be connected to the protocol? Questions like that would be like akin to voting if you held a stock or something. But voting in a DAO right now, it's very unclear whether that gives you liability for things that happen in the DAO. So if a victim loses money on a blank protocol, and that is because there was a bug in one of the smart contracts and people in the DAO voted not to do an audit, does everybody in the DAO have to hold like joint and several liability? And that's something that came up recently in a CFTC case called Uki DAO about the CFTC essentially said that anyone who had voted whether for or against a proposal had liability. So as VCs in the space or RAs in the space, if you hold a lot of tokens in a DAO, you have to think about what your responsibilities are, both to your investors and otherwise. And also you have to think about like your fiduciary duties are to your investors. So you want to help them and that might require you voting. But what does that mean? So that's one question. Another one that I think is really interesting is MNPI. So material non-public information, that is what leads to insider trading. So if you know something that the public doesn't know is a material to the price of something like a public stock, you can't trade on that and you can't share that information because that would be insider trading, which is not good and taken very seriously by the U.S. government as it should. So the like sort of legal framework for that, particularly in the public stock realm. So if I know information about Apple, that's private because I sit on the board or I have a friend who works there by mistake told me or whatever, I shouldn't be trading on that. But how does that work in crypto? So it's public sort of like stocks. It's so like individual customers and retail customers have access to it. But a lot of people building in the crypto space, particularly in DeFi or in smaller projects, don't think about MMPI in that way. They're not trained in the way that large companies like Apple are. So how, as an investor, do you make sure that your companies understand what MMPI, your people working on your team understand what that is, and you think about how it applies to crypto? So those are like three big buckets that I think about constantly that I think are somewhat unique and being developed in the crypto space. And what's really interesting about this is like all these concepts exist in some way in traditional finance, but trying to figure out how to apply them to crypto has been such a fascinating and interesting challenge that I think industry and government are struggling over how and where to meet on this. Thanks, Jesse. It, it's really interesting, Alana, that Jesse started out providing a big picture advice for the compliance officers and the like, but where she ended at was on at least conceptually a, a concept that makes me think about the kind of public private partnership that law enforcement thinks about a lot. And all of us on this podcast are former or current government officials. So the concept of private public partnership is an important concept. Now, as I understand it, the New York State Department of Financial Services and perhaps the New York State Office of the Attorney General monitors market activity and compliance with respect to crypto platforms and exchanges, especially those that have the bit license in New York. And having the bit license means that they're authorized to operate in New York. Given the critical importance of New York to the crypto industry, would you please discuss how government agencies strive towards a, a public-private partnership in crypto investigations and how your office collaborates with, would say, DFS with the New York AG and others? Yeah, I'm glad that you brought up those two agencies because they both have great digital and virtual assets unit, specifically the Investor Protection Unit at the New York State Attorney General's Office that 
has people dedicated to just cryptocurrency exchange work. And even though they're doing regulatory and I'm in the criminal sector, we still overlap and dialogue and collaborate a lot. There have been times where matters have been referred to New York DFS, let's say, because there's an online uh, cryptocurrency exchange uh, that is purporting to be legitimate and purported to have a bit license. So a quote unquote investor who thinks they have been defrauded may approach New York State DFS or the the AG's office first. And then it turns out that the, the whole thing was a scam. So it's important that I'm always in touch with those agencies because I certainly do get referrals from them for cases. In terms of the public-private partnership, so I used to primarily, well, I was in, uh, in special narcotics with Clark's unit years ago. So my evidence used to be memory-based, based on victim and witness testimony, tangible things that were happening in the street, contraband that we could recover. And now my evidence is 99% records-based or digital evidence. So it is not uncommon for me to send out at least maybe three to even 500 at times subpoenas for records on one case. And all those records are from private corporations, cryptocurrency exchanges, internet service providers, phone companies, cloud hosting providers, you name it. So... If our cases were ever to go to trial, it's entirely feasible that I might not even have a a law enforcement officer as a really crucial witness. It's going to be records-based. My witnesses are going to be custodians of the records or representatives from those privately held entities. So the private-public partnership in these investigations is way more crucial than in any other area of the law that I've ever investigated before. My most successful cases, I think, have come uh, from referrals from private uh, companies or crypto exchanges where they have a really robust um, investigations or law enforcement relations team, and they're connecting the dots um, on their own and referring cases to us and working with us and, and supporting with us rather than make us jump through hurdles or go through time-consuming process just to get the necessary records. It's also uh, really helpful when those private companies that that get subpoenaed a lot have law enforcement guides or law enforcement portals readily available to us so we can interpret these records, which sometimes just look like a a mishmash of internal words or codes that that don't make sense to an an outside uh, person who's investigating the records. So I... I can't even stress enough how important it is to have a good working and collegial relationship with those private companies in the tech industry. And it it pains me that a lot of trust and safety and investigative uh, employees have been uh, the recipients of some of those layoffs. I I guess that can be fairly typical because they're not a a profit maze. And I know there's been a, a lot of layoffs recently building part of the company, but in the end, that's going to that's gonna hurt the users or that's going to enable bad actors to exploit those platforms for their own good. So I hope uh, in the future we can definitely rebuild some of those departments that have suffered layoffs recently. Thanks, Alona. Clark and Kyle, both of you have extensive experience in working with the tools that help identify, monitor, manage, and in some cases prevent illicit activity from infiltrating the uh, financial system. Clark, you and I have worked together for decades, especially in bar association activities. For instance, you and I recently worked extremely hard on an upcoming city bar report on artificial intelligence and machine learning in financial services that focuses on opportunities and challenges in the AML CFT um, space. This report is quite timely and likely to be um, issued by the City Bar um, this month. What are some of the key highlights of this report, especially those key findings that would benefit AMLCFT compliance officers and strengthen AMLCF compliance programs? It is gracious of you to ask me to offer a few remarks about that report. For the record, Jerome is the one who took the labor in order and shepherded this report. The the report touches on convergence of financial crime, which is a key takeaway, at least made from Kyle's remarks, a vehicle 
perhaps set up by an attorney that conceals beneficial ownership can be used for money laundering, but it can also be used to pay a bribe, a violation of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and now the Foreign Extortion Act. And it can be used to transfer payments or goods in violation of sanctions. There are two other points that I'll highlight about the report. One is that at a short and medium term level, there needs to be better regulatory financial institution interaction and more feedback, such as specific regulatory expectations with or without the use of artificial intelligence. Long term, artificial intelligence is here to stay. That, I think, is a big point of the report. National security including geo, uh, geopolitical risks, pronouncement and pronouncements from international organizations such as the Financial Action Task Force and the Wolfsburg Group, which is a consortium of some of the world's largest banks to develop best practices, require entities to incorporate artificial intelligence into financial compliance sooner rather than later. So there are external pressures that will require compel financial institutions to incorporate AI into their compliance programs. And I'll end with an example. OFAC, which is U.S. Treasury's Office of Foreign Asset Controls in charge of sanctions, poses sanctions not only on individuals, by naming individuals and entities, but also by providing narrative descriptions, prohibitions, and limitations, for example, export control violations or technology, as Kyle discussed, or code. When that happens, it's artificial intelligence, which can screen vast amounts of unstructured data, not a compliance program that screens only against structured data that may enable entities to comply. Kyle, you, your firm specializes in providing assistance to both industry participants and law enforcement. What are some of the tools that would help prevent illicit activity from infiltrating the financial system? Or what tools would help detect and identify suspicious activity that should be reported? Thank you very much for the question, Jerome. And the easy answer is our tool. The tool that I work for, TRM Labs, the, it's software as a service. It is a software for that essentially helps anyone involved in the system identify and track illicit activity on 29 different blockchains, thousands of assets. Practically, what that means is that we support public sector entities all over the world that are tracking illicit transactions. But on the same side, we provide transaction monitoring and wallet screening for centralized and decentralized entities that want to prevent illicit money from coming onto their platforms. A concrete example being a decentralized platform does not want, say, Osama bin Laden's money, Bitcoin, to come onto its platform. The sanctions law, as has been referenced here today, prohibits any transactions, financial transaction included, between a sanctioned party and someone in the United States or a United States citizen. So what that really means is that these entities want to prevent those transactions from confirming those transactions. I would defer to some of my smart colleagues here on the call to define what uh, a transaction is as it relates to some of these protocols. But the bottom line is most, most of these entities throughout the world, and we work with VASPs throughout the world, they don't want bad money on their platform. And so you can use the tool and the data, the underlying data, which says when TRM Labs shows that Osama bin Laden's Bitcoin address is ABCD1234, as an example, if Osama bin Laden initiates a transaction to one of these DeFi platforms or especially one of these centralized exchanges, that's going to come up and they're going to see using the tool, oh, well, this is sanctioned address. This is sanctioned money. We're not going to, we're not going to take it on. We're not going to uh, make this person a client. 
or perform any sort of transaction. What that ultimately means is that it helps to make the financial sa system safer. Now, there are millions and millions of addresses out there that many times some of the some of the folks that are engaged in illicit activities, they create new addresses, there's no history. We've talked a lot about data and machine learning and artificial intelligence. We use machine learning at TRM Labs for the benefit of the financial sector and for our law enforcement and regulatory partners. What I mean by that is that we have addresses that are associated, which we have ground truth association that this, these addresses on whatever blockchain are associated with illicit activity. The relationship we use, that's where we use machine learning and we're hoping to incorporate some more advanced uh, artificial intelligence to show ownership of or control of additional addresses, really in order to make our customer bases, exchanges, platforms around the world, and prosecutors and investigators around the world to enable them to trace the money. If you are a regulator, to make sure that money is not going on to various platforms. If you are one of the platforms to make sure you can prevent the money from coming in or de-risk and kick it out if it is there. And then for law enforcement, the background of all the folks on this call here, you need to be able to trace the proceeds. And so when someone has illicit proceeds, going back to the, the Bin Laden example, when Bin Laden buys his virtual currency or when he sells his virtual currency, someone like Alona or Clark or Jesse in her previous life is going to want to issue subpoena requests, issue information requests, depending on the country, how they do it to find out the underlying partner, the underlying associated person with Bin Laden. Maybe you get an email address, maybe you get a physical location, maybe you get, you learn where Bin Laden keeps his larger pot of money and you can go in and effectuate a seizure. So again, to wrap up where we're at, we love, there's nothing that I love more than when we are supporting our public sector partners and our private sector partners to identify the bad money on these blockchains of which there is a significant amount. Though in echoing what Ms. Brooks said earlier, it, the bad guys are just gonna find novel ways to move illicit assets. And this is not a unique problem for virtual currency. And in fact, the great thing about virtual currency is you have public blockchains. And so anyone can track the movement of the funds and you have firms like TRM Labs who have uh, a really fine-tuned expertise in attributing and uh, going through petabytes of data and identifying the illicit actions so that anyone can trace it on a public blockchain, making uh, regulatory jobs more effective, law enforcement jobs more effective, and the private sector, all of our customers in the private sector, to enable them to uh, effectuate their compliance duties and their obligations and protecting the financial system. Thanks, Kyle. <clears throat> and thanks, Jesse, Clark, and Alona for addressing these key national security issues at the federal, state, and local levels and explaining how market participants and stakeholders can work together to protect the national security of the U.S., especially the financial system, including by identifying some of the available tools that compliance officers and other independent risk managers have available to them. We look forward to your participation in the next podcast hosted by the task force. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode of the New York City Bar Association podcast. Opinions expressed are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the city bar. If you enjoy this podcast, please like and subscribe wherever you listen. Find more city bar podcasts on Apple, Spotify, Google, iHeart, or at our website at www.nycbar.org slash podcasts. Be sure to check out This Lawyer's Life, a professional development podcast where we talk with lawyers about seizing opportunities, learning lessons the hard way, and about what makes them tick. And don't miss Building Belonging, a podcast that embraces authentic conversations about DEIB solutions by amplifying the most marginalized voices in the legal industry and exploring spaces others dare not. This podcast was produced and edited by Eli Cohen.